couple here. Welcome to the uh, lug. We meet the third Wednesday of the month, and this just happens to be the third Wednesday. Uh, the cadence for SIGBAP, or the special interest group with beverage and provisions, aka the social hour, uh, we'd said, I think, like, three months as sort of a regular cadence for it. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, if no one has any objections, uh, the next meeting uh, probably will be at Felix and Oscars again, unless people want to try somewhere else. And uh, at that point, uh, I'm all ears. But that seems to be they have both good pizza and a reasonable uh, agreeableness to having a bunch of nerds invade on a Wednesday night. So uh, we do have a mailing list, and there is Slack and IRC, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, uh, this is the point where normally we uh, talk about news. I quick Googled up some stuff that had happened this month, at least in theory, unless things hallucinated. Uh, the, the biggest one is the uh, thing that we're going to talk about later, so we'll table that. Uh, Debian 11.3 released. Uh, there's a bunch of other things that got released, as well as uh, Red Hat basically has a new certification where things are a bit more sta standardized. Uh, Linux kernel 5.17 was released. Uh, a open source killer to uh, Figma. It has some cool new features. And uh, Ubuntu 24.04 was actually delayed a little bit in their beta release because they were busy mitigating and curing uh, the, the blowback from uh, XZ as well as I think of doing a little uh, paranoid soul searching to see if they could find anything else that was wrong. They didn't officially say that. And then also there was an absolutely hilarious uh, fluffle with uh, Linus uh, around uh, Tabs versus uh, spaces. Uh, apparently, there there was a whole thing about how uh, there was a uh, a uh, um, parser that uh, Kate can beg that. Uh, uh, Parsons to read stuff and wanted to replace a tab character with a space to help it uh, parse the file. And, and then uh, uh, Linus basically chucked in a bunch more tabs just to completely screw with uh, that parser to make them fix it. Uh, uh, he didn't want to make things uglier than necessary, but it might be necessary if it turns out that we see more of the silly tooling. So, uh, yeah, anyway, though, in his usual, uh, I, I just found this to be yet another linicism that was uh, truly amusing. Anyone has any other news, uh, feel free to chime in. Okay. I'll have to say that Carrying something on, my team I'm did sure made it. Matt will uh, cover the, the rest. Okay, I'm happy ahead. to see that something that my so I'm proud to see something that my team did made this uh made this event. My team at work is somewhat responsible for the criteria chroma criteria thing for REL. Yeah, if you want to explain that, I I spent whole ones of minutes uh, asking. Uh, uh, Copilot to explain it, and I completely forgot it uh, in the, the time. So uh, feel free. Yeah. So common criteria is a certification um, ran by a few different government, but mostly no ran by the U.S. government, and it's a whole big process where various vendors can go through and get their OS certified, um, saying this is how you can figure it to comply with these um, common criteria standards. Um, it's quite a process. So. Lots and lots of documentation. I got the feeling that it was a lot of work and uh, not not completely uh, useless, but uh, also something that uh, probably wasn't going to impact my day to day life. No, no. Yes, offense. correct. 
Yes, unless you're in like very specific parts of the U.S. government, it probably doesn't affect you. Which I am no longer part of the government, so uh, I'm happy to say that. Oh, and there is someone actually at the door. Yeah. Uh, Jared, if you can. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, though, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, news is uh, definitely fun. Uh, so uh, to, to answer uh, Dan's question about which May Day evening, it would be the third Wednesday of the, the month, whatever that ends up being uh, for the, uh, the sick bath. I will send out emails ahead of time, hopefully the day before, not the day, just the day before, uh, reminding people of it. And uh, if I haven't said anything by the week before, someone keep me honest on Slack because I completely forgot to look at the calendar. <clears throat> Anyway, though, we had just finished the news here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, as uh, I hinted at, I asked co pilot for help, and they totally uh, gave me the, the latest news and information. So, yeah, you tell me not to yet? The, well, he's very well, maybe hallucination. So, <clears throat> I'm confused about one thing, and that's the Debian release. Because 12 is the current release, and they're saying 11 and 9 was on in February. Again, hallucination. Hallucination. <laughs> okay, fair, fair. So, oh, um, and some of these may be what happened oh, in the okay. last six months. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, though. The, the Linux and tabs was really the only big thing that, that just was pretty completely easy. entertained me. Uh, there, there was, uh, yeah, it, it's it's fun. Uh, I don't see anything in the article that says whether he's a tab person or a space person. But I'm assuming if he's inserting hidden tabs, he's a tab person. Uh, so uh, uh, I didn't think that was. Kind of tabs that that meant. Huh? Okay. Yeah. I, my my understanding was it was a, a, a hunk of code file that uh, yeah the editor was running and they they wanted uh, you know I I don't know uh, Todd if a, a SBOM has been put in place for uh, XZ yet. Uh, yeah, wouldn't that be a part of other applications, SBOM? It, yeah, that, that would be my my impression. Also, I don't know that it would have actually helped in this case, just for the fact that it was a trusted contributor to the, the project. Yeah, it wouldn't have prevented the issue, but the part that it would kind of help with is if you're scrambling to find out where the hell this library is used. Um, if, if everyone in the world was up to SBOM update after and accessible, and then you could somehow <clears throat> correlate them all together, it would make it easier. But uh, I think that's a type Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, so, anyway, though, the uh, on to the, the actual feature here. Uh, Yes, Chad, uh, I'll, I'll be covering that in the, the talk that uh, they need to remove the binary test files and repo handling and all stuff like that. So anyway, the, the main event, uh, the uh, XZ hack and what it means to you and why you should be scared. Uh, the, the standard intro and also a good excuse for me to use my, my headshot. Uh, uh, by day, I slim code, and uh, just as a uh, disclaimer, this presentation is completely my own, except for the stuff that I stole off the internet. And uh, I speak only for myself, and uh, the commissioner of baseball disavows all knowledge of this presentation. So, yeah, uh, 
I deal with scientific computing slash British data slash writing code. And somehow I still remain the president of the LUG. Uh, I'm more than happy to have an election at any time anyone wants to run. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I have a website. I'm also on the Twitter site, long as Elon hasn't burned it down yet. And you can also catch me in other spots like Hackaderm and what have you. Uh, so uh, also, as I said before, I want to thank Sean for the, the info dump on uh, uh, Slack because it really helped uh, uh, build this uh, presentation and make more sense of the, the uh, world. Because I, I admit I sort of stuck my head in the sand there for a bit and hadn't been following it until uh, I looked a little deeper and it just was really scary. So anyway, though, uh, the TLDR, if you, you just laze your eyes over and you want to go grab a hamburger, et cetera, this is the part that you need to just pay attention to. Basically, this uh, XZ utility was all around compressing files and data compression. And so somebody snuck a backdoor into it. They, there are bets on whether or not it's a nation state. Who knows? It was someone with a really long con, though. And uh, if you have version 560 or 561, you're, it's in there. Uh, and basically, uh, it's leveraged by SSH to uh, that if you had a uh, certificate that was signed with their magic key that would uh, uh, trigger this uh, vulnerability, uh, basically it would execute whatever the heck it wanted to on your machine. Uh, thanks to uh, one guy at Microsoft, who yes, I know is more than just some random guy at Microsoft, but it's a fun story that way. Uh, he's also a uh, big Postgres guy. He's on the official list of core maintainers. So. Yeah. Which is why Microsoft hired him. <laughs> yep. Proof that if you, do, you, do, yeah. Yeah. If you do good things and are a big enough deal, companies will fall over you to hire you. But anyway, though, he noticed that it was an issue uh, when he was logging into his machine. He sent up the flare saying, hey, guys, <laughs> this is bad. And... Uh, queued the uh, panic and uh, people working to fix it. And the good news is for most Linux versions, except for those uh, nuts who are on uh, things like Arch, uh, and you're not running anything really bleeding edge, you're probably okay. But we'll dive into how to check to be sure that you're definitely okay here in a little bit. But uh, basically, really... In the end, this is a near miss that uh, sort of is concerning for the future more than anything else, thankfully. It was caught in time. The little kid stuck his finger in the dike, and the, the world is a um, semi safe place again. Or is it because there could be far more of these sitting out there lurking like a uh, iceberg waiting to hit the, the ship of Linux and Microsoft and or anyone else? Because, yay. So uh, credit to uh, this one tweet here. The link is in the bottom there. Uh, basically, th this is one of the only times that I've completely made a uh, talk off of uh, one tweet alone. And it is a very awesome one. So we're going to go from this big uh, infographic that's a little hard to read, actually, it's surprisingly easy to read from here. But yay, high def if we had it on the, the projector. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's zoom in a little bit. So what what is this uh, issue? It's uh, XZ Utilities is a set of open source tools that can do uh, LZMA compression, LZMA2 specifically. And it's great for if you need to lob files around from one machine to another, especially is how I like to use it. They do say that it's not really stable for long-term storage. Use gzip uh, and stuff like that for if you're wanting to store files for a long time, but neither here nor there. It's uh, great for high compression 
and if you need to move uh, and make really small files. Uh, some of the more notable uses here lately have been that, uh, if I remember right, kernel now has the ability to compress stuff uh, and have compressed uh, modules in it uh, that have, are with the, this compression. Anyway, though, uh, uh, completely going to butcher his name, but real nice guy at Microsoft uh, emailed the uh, uh, open source security community saying that he found something that was really bad in it. And this is the portion of the email that has it. Basically, he said that there were some odd symptoms around the LZMA uh, on my Debian SIND installation. Uh, logins with SSH were taking a lot of time on the CPU, and I was having Valgrind issues, which uh, a lot of time, I believe it was like half a second. So 508 milliseconds. This is what started this. Yeah. Uh, which I mean, at least logging on my corporate machine or anything like that, I'd just yell at the security people and say that they were uh, uh, installed yet another soul sucking uh, app to monitor uh, whether or not I was trying to expo data off the network or something like that and just chuck it up as whatever. Even my Linux machine, I probably curse and need to reboot it or something because it was over half a second. A anyway, though, the world is thankful that he did, and he dives into uh, what the problem is, and actually, if you want to go uh, later here and read it, it, it really is a masterful bugger report uh, that there's an issue here, and I wish the rest of the world would take lessons from this guy, because it's awesome. And that's part of the reason why he's a PE at uh, uh, Microsoft, because he... He's good like that. So anyway, though, that led to a CVE where uh, there was malicious code discovered in upstream tarballs, blah, blah, blah. It was a series of complex uh, stuff that happened. And basically, it extracts the we'll, we'll dive into the, the what here because there, there's a lot of stuff there. And it's a fun read. But uh, the, the infographic dives into it far better than, uh, far more approachably than what uh, boring government uh, write ups are. So, yeah, how did we get here? There was this uh, uh, one user, JIAT75, uh, who, Jiatan, uh, uh, whether or not that's his actual name, who knows? But uh, at least the, this fictional person who, uh, all the way back in 2021, he created a GitHub account, and then he started making commits to the uh, XZ repo and uh, started slowly sneaking things in. This truly is a long con, which is part of the reason why uh, we say that it, it very likely is a nation state of some kind that did this because... Who has the patience to pull this uh, operation? Uh, yeah. He, he, so anyway, though, he started and assuming he here, it, just because you got to assume something, uh, slowly started sneaking in bits and pieces of the problem into the code here over the, the space of a really, really long time. And so it's impressive how long from uh, 628 all the way till uh, 216, and then even, uh, or sorry, three, 309 of 2024 uh, was the, the last uh, sort of uh, shoe drop. And basically, what does it do? It's got these uh, macros that end up executing and, uh, We'll, we'll jump down here, but basically that's where he snuck in these sort of macros and stuff into the, the source code. And so what ends up happening is he's got the, this test file with a payload in it, 
And uh, with the, the script as he's building it, he ends up uh, it ends up sneaking uh, the the data out into the actual uh, executable part of the program, and then uh, deciphers it and sneaks it into the the actual uh, build itself. So. Uh, Basically, in the stage two part of it, uh, they, they basically destroy, uh, decipher this code. They run a said script on it. And uh, then the, the bigger uh, uh, trick is they also end up adding it to the uh, uh, dot getting more as well so that it doesn't make it if you check it back in. Uh, so in the end, this vulnerability ends up being there only if you build it and you run the tests and all that stuff, uh, not if you're just looking at the source code itself and you get it. Uh, there's a bit better of a graphic here in a minute. Uh, I, I did wonder outside of the, the one uh, uh, tweet just because it, it, they, there was another uh, graphic that uh, explained how it works a little bit better, but basically, and there, there's also another uh, bigger write-up uh, in a couple minutes here we'll look at the, that shows the actual bytes and how we get there. But basically what ends up happening is that uh, it will, it basically sneaks itself in and is waiting for SSH to run it uh, to uh, when you uh, call it. And uh, the good news is the uh, signature that would trigger this uh, vulnerability has never been seen out in the wild. So it's, as far as we know, never been used. So they caught it early enough and uh, yay. So essentially, Thanks to Wiz for the, this great graphic that was in there, the write up, another great article. I'd recommend reading it. Basically, what happens is a uh, nice guy in the hoodie here ends up uh, uh, committing some code and uh, build the host is basically executed with this malicious code that injects itself into the uh, configuration script. Then the configuration script runs and manipulates the linker and compile flags to uh, interfere with the simple, simple resolution process so that it, it isn't obvious what's happening as it compiles. So if you look at what's happening, it, it isn't uh, as easy to catch. And then as you run the make file, it basically uh, ends up uh, causing this one uh, uh, Simple to point at malicious code in runtime. And how it would be used is uh, basically a uh, bad guy, let's just call him Eve because he's evil, uh, ends up uh, sending a public key with the payload to a vulnerable version of SSHD. And uh, it ends up calling this RSA public decrypt, which then calls to the LZMA. Uh, uh, library that's been compiled and has a vulnerability in it. It then points at the uh, malicious code, which sees that it has the uh, uh, payload, and then it passes the payload to, uh, system to run it, and now he has the keys to the kingdom. Hopefully that made sense. Still won't fully get how the, the symbol file. Yeah, doing this for some moments. That's fascinating, but the build the host, the rest of it, the normal piece that I'm missing in my brain, but keep going. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dive there. There's a great write up on it that, that Chan provided. And again, thank you so much for that. It was a huge help. Uh, but first, who was impacted? First, we'll, we'll go with the people that can breathe easy. Uh, basically, anybody that's slow uh, in releases. So Ubuntu, Alpine, Amazon Linux, Gen 2, Mint, which is basically just Ubuntu, whatever. Uh, Gen 2 is clear? 
apparently. They, they didn't bother to ever uh, uh, add in the, the latest, uh, greatest version of uh, XZ. So, yeah, sure. uh, one of those things that if you want things faster, you, you, you have to send a pull request to them, I guess. I thought Rel was in the clear, too. Uh, yes, so Red Hat itself is in the clear. Uh, I'm dinging them for the fact that some of their properties are not uh, in the clear. Uh, plus, it's just a good excuse to, to rid the, the Red Hat person on, on the, the call. Uh, but uh, so I mean, you I... had... Go ahead. I mean, so what was affected? So basically anything released, Fedora's betas were affected, um, but nothing released. If you're running a release Fedora or released rel and its clones were all fine yep and yeah I, I i was leaving that for for last but uh yeah essentially uh you're, you're correct that uh anything that's production was just fine really the the only people who took it in the pants was uh kali linux and uh anybody had a rolling release like open or uh arch that pride themselves in being on the cutting edge of bleeding. So yeah, uh, Debian sit unstable, alpha released to uh, 561.-1. Again, it's unstable. Surprise. Uh, Kali Linux, uh, if you uh, ran your update between March 26 to 29 and you haven't updated it since, OpenSUSE is Tumbleweed and MicroOS is rolling releases. And then also Arch uh, had uh, a vulnerability for a bit. Especially scary is the fact that if you're using Arch Docker and you built your Im images and compiled them between uh, off of images that were created between 20 uh, or 224 and to 328, uh, you need to go back and rebuild your Docker images or if you're running Docker off of any of those other things. But again, I, I'm questioning your sanity. If you're trying to uh, build Docker images off of Debian Unstable, you're nuts. But, uh, and then Red Hat, if you were uh, one of those two specific uh, Fedora uh, beta sort of, or rolling early, early, early bleeding edge releases, but again, you shouldn't be running those in production and trusting that you're not going to get hacked with those anyway, because yeah, there's a reason why a staple is so usually trusted a bit more. So that's somewhat editorializing, but if you do just want to say, okay, am I vulnerable? Then there's two great ways to uh, check. Either you can, which will run it here in just a couple minutes, just in uh, Linux, but essentially, if you run uh, the witch on XC, and if you see 5.6.blah, then yes, you're, you're in it. Uh, but even if you do have the, the vulnerable version of XC, if you don't have SSHD running on your machine, it doesn't matter because you need both uh, things there in order to hit it. Because without XZ, or without SSHD, you can't actually uh, pass it and call it, at least as far as we know. I would say for now, you're okay, but I don't think people fully understood the code changes and yep. everything that it does. So like, if you see those windows, get them off your system. But... Yes, and th that's sort of what I was going to get to here of that, okay, you can kind of breathe, but also, it's just best if you kill it and uh, kill it with fire and get it out of there because, as Sean said, you don't know exactly what the heck all of the stuff is here. And it's sort of like having a uh, uh, bomb sitting in the corner. Sure, it's safe as long as you don't bump into it. But is it really safe? Yeah, because the LZMA compression stuff is used in all sorts of other things that could also be used in this library. Like, mm -hmm. so I take a chance. Yeah, it's even 
you know, all the way down in the kernel level stuff that it's used. So, uh, and then web browsers and email servers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there is. Well, no, but the, the idea of compression is and and that's yeah. yeah. But so yeah, the the uh, terrifying thing is that it's everywhere and uh or if you're you're wanting to use JFrog has a real nice little script that if you run it, uh it will tell you that you're in the clear or not. And it of course has some Really cool ASCII art in it too. I just truly impressive. I, I mean, it's been a while since I've seen fun the ASCII art in a tool like this. So yeah, oh, so. I, I live a sad life, I guess. No, but I mean, it's been a while since you've seen ASCII art. Yeah. I mean, other you than said he lives a sad life. Yeah. Give him a break. Yeah. Uh, okay. other, that, 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 yeah. Go other than the scripts that, that I've written that uh, have like logos and stuff like that in there, just because it was fun, and uh, there there was a point that uh, somebody uh, made a comment that we should have our logo in all of our software, and uh, so <laughs> I, yeah. I created the ASCII version of it to sneak in there, and uh, yeah. Got a lot of laughs, but then, uh, yeah, we, we, I was encouraged to take it out because we're not on trademark. Uh, had look feel issues with it, but yeah. Anyway, <laughs> amazing. That's a whole other story. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, the link to uh, how to use it and how to check it and all that stuff where I uh, grabbed the screen scrape from. But uh, for the, the more deeper dive into just exactly what what happened, uh, thanks to the, this uh, uh, person who has a full write up with all the, the debugging and everything else, just exactly what what's happening here, and a full write up, you, you can really wander down the rabbit hole of just exactly what what's going on as well as uh, there's an example of by basically patching in their own version of uh, OpenSSH to uh, log uh, uh, any sort of connection attempts with this key as a honeypot. And then there's also a version where uh, they can, they've can swapped out the, the key with someone else, with their own uh, generated key and then basically can just run uh, they their own script against it, but yeah, they and then they dive through what exactly the format is and all that stuff. It's a pretty deep uh, reading, and yeah, they, they, there's a lot of uh, stuff to unpack there. I, if you're really interested, I'd recommend diving deeper into that. But that that's going a little above and beyond what. Uh, I, I had time to fully absorb other than the fact that it was hellishly cool and clever and clearly someone who's fairly clever built this. And that's another thing why it sort of smells like a nation state because clearly there probably was a team of very clever people who thought about this for a while and did bad things. Plus the, the fact that they had it sitting there for so long and didn't play, play the slow game to roll it out. Uh, mo most places really couldn't sit on their hands for that long and just trust that no one's going to figure it out. So yeah, uh, I'd recommend diving into that deeper. But what does this mean for the future? Really, this is why we can't have nice things. Uh, they, this sort of brings about a question of can you actually trust uh, your committers and the, the person who sends a helpful uh, pull request with a bug in uh, and a test case proving out their bug and uh, some unit test casing work to prove that it's trustworthy. Can you trust them? I don't know. Maybe. Or is it just a long con to get in your good graces? 
Uh, so the question is, one of the recommendations was, well, you shouldn't trust anyone who's just mm, uh, a random, unknown, faceless person. You should only trust people who go to conferences and uh, you've met and you really uh, know your committers, sort of like uh, know your customer banking sort of thing, okay. at which point people pointed out that that's crazy because there's lots of good people who have contributions who are also really poor and can't just go to big conferences plus scripts like, or things like uh, NTPD where there's like one or two people who actually truly care about it and do they have time to go meet all their people? No, you, you need like a whole big faceless organization to properly vet and background check your people and all that stuff and nobody got time for that. So what is the right answer here? We don't know yet. Everyone's kind of in a panic. Uh, so I think the other thing to point out about this specifically is they became one of the maintainers. Of the yeah. Project. So like if you can't trust your own project's maintainers, who can you trust? Yeah. Well, yeah, they think that they became that's a key yeah. uh, turn there. Turning point is this person who did not contribute a lot here just enough. How did they get maintainership? That no one has met. They asked for it. Like, yeah. <laughs> and they were like, dude, you're, you're interested in this? So you want to sold it for free? Sure. Sold. <laughs> we, we, well, one of the products for you are no yeah. way. <laughs> so, yes. Which one of the terrifying things is there is actually an example of this already happening again. Uh, now, whatever nation state that is, is like, quick, deploy the rest, deploy the rest. Yeah, so the, this was the uh, uh, OpenJS Foundation. Basically, somebody uh, tried to uh, jockey to get a uh, committer stat maintainer status and uh, hadn't had much uh, involvement yet. And uh, yeah, uh, thankfully, it got shut down. And now what evil lied in their, their heart and they wanted to do to uh, OpenJS? Foundation, who knows? Uh, they thankfully people are going to be a little bit more gun shy about handing out uh, friends and powers, but also that is another thing that's going to be a uh, drag and a boat anchor on the uh, entire free and open source world because now everyone's looking over their shoulders. So Getting someone who's willing and interested to be a maintainer actually street cred enough to do it, that, that really is a big question mark right now. Okay, how, how do you contribute and how do you become a maintainer now when no, either you have to be like uh, rock star level status that people trust you or, uh, yeah, who knows? And of course, there, there's still the obligatory XKCD uh, uh, question of how do we get more people to help with that random uh, project that some guy in the draft has been maintaining since 2003. Like, uh, I know MTBD is my, my biggest favorite go-to because network time is a very important thing, but there's like one, maybe two guys who actually care enough about it to maintain it and work on it and the bad news is everyone gets hit by a bus at some point in their life and then it ends up being their life uh, and how do you prepare for that sort of transition and uh, finding people to trust because you know, if you not company into NTP well that, that would be really bad so yeah anyway though that, that was my my rant for the night. Anyone who has other comments or thoughts, uh, Todd, you said strings. Uh, Todd, if you care to elaborate, I, I'm not sure exactly. Was that from the uh, checker from JFrog? It might be strings. Could be uh, looking back here. 
Yeah, one of the slides had strings on it. Because you're basically running strings on the XC executable on the Zeta Baz 5.6. Oh, yeah, the, the uh, it was for yeah. yeah. So yeah, it was the, the string search on uh, the the grepping of which version. Uh, and yeah. And uh, Chris, glad to have you. Uh, and good to see that uh, the, the Australians uh, jumped in. Uh, and good morning to you guys. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, though, that, that was basically uh, the, the quick dive that uh, I, I put together. And again, thank, if I've seen this far, it's because I stood on the shoulder of giants who uh, worked on this, and I'm just the, the dumb, non uh, borderline technical ish guy uh, uh, throwing presentation stuff here, as was uh, bragged about in the uh, Slack uh, channel. Hopefully, it was a better write up than half of the blogs on the internet, though. Good job. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anyone else with comments, questions, uh, uh, complaints? Question. Mm -hmm. So the part that I'm not fully understanding in my brain is how it existed in tarballs without existing in the source code, but then people were able to find it in the source code. So what happened was inside of the, these unit test uh, cases that had, one of them was supposed to be like a bad uh, compressed uh, file and then that wouldn't uncompress right and they were unit testing around the fact that it should throw errors or stuff like that is my understanding of it. Uh, they, there was a uh, hidden, they, there was a uh, obfuscated version of the file that if you did a certain set of bit shifts and stuff, you'd end up being at the, the actual code that was meant to be executed. And so as part of the, the build process, it snuck itself into uh, that, that large compressed good and the bad. Okay, because I yeah. remember some of those files. Yep, so the, those files were what it was actually contained in. Oh, because, okay. So it's not that people found the source code of yeah, it was hidden the thing directly. Yeah. They found the binary blob it was stored in. Yep. So because the build process generates a tarball, you didn't see it like as readable code in the source code because it was never there. So yeah, in the source uh, code okay. it was hidden. And then as you ran the build process, it would that's the piece that I was okay, that's that's what I've been missing this whole time. Yeah. Is that going from the the test file to because I knew that it was like a multi-stage like do this, do that, do the other. I just didn't get how. Yeah. Can you upload like your release without having to go through a build process through uh GitHub? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, you could have the code be one thing and stuff on a completely randomly different thing. And that's and that's what I thought it was. But then when they're talking about reverse engineering it, I'm like, how are you doing that if you don't actually have the... I mean, you can reverse the binary. So they were looking at things yep. in memory of like stepping through the, the program. Like oh, OK. Something. Like GDB style. Yep. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not seeing what it does. Oh, okay. Because one of the spots that it, it became evident there was some sort of shenanigans going on was running Valgrind. Valgrind yeah. is like a memory level debugger. Okay. Uh, when you're running uh, your code to see, okay, are there memory leaks? Are there weird unknown pointer things going on and stuff like that? And basically, the person had done a good enough job of making it so that the vulnerability was in there. But he didn't do a, a good enough job that Valgrind was errorless. Yeah. Which is hard to do, right? Yeah, I was going to say when I keep my L code normally, Valgrind usually has some components. <laughs> yeah, like it's just like when you're developing C, you run Valgrind under code. And like you said before, it'll tell you like if you're not freeing things, like there's a whole bunch of check in your memory. And, and they were calling out, I thought it was amusing at the site, they were calling out to like said and. Uh, Ken, 
multi, it said multiple hit calls to remove content. It's like, well, no wonder why it slowed it down by 508 milliseconds. Well, no, that, that was during the build process to basically reverse out from that. that oh, okay. Get yeah. the, the payload under way okay so that wasn't what the compiled one did that was still oh, okay so they would yeah. right the reason why it was slow in runtime is because i think it was like point list of all running processes or something of it it was do the backdoor was enumerating something and that's what was slow gotcha okay I, so yeah it would have made it faster and less errorful they might have got away with it for a while yeah we, correct. which is where it's both amazing that this is like master level writers, <laughs> and then a rookie unforced error that got them caught. Yep. yep. So they're, they're they're not exactly. publicizing it. it won't necessarily happen again. But yeah. I mean, you never know. It's like in there's this there's a scene in the blacklist where this guy is the you know the world's FBI's most wanted whatever uh, gets randomly caught by a beat cop. It's like really, that's how it happens. And, and to be fair, the uh, the fact that he was able to belt grind, debug it, and find that there was something wrong with, and and call it out, that, that, that's more than just a beat like a cop level uh, investigation. That, that's someone who's just mainly uh, pedantic about the, the fact that his logging was taking. Half a second longer than yeah. it used to, and wondering why. So I mean, that, that, that's don't knock it. Oh yeah, no, I, I, and I, I mean that in the, the best way that the world needs more people who care about that, right? And I'm over here just wanting my third monitor to work. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I will say, I will say like this. As a couple things that the open source community needs to change. Number one, the way most packaging, the way you build a package. So, like, when if I want to build, like, for XZ, we'll, we'll talk about the package. Like, when you want to build it for your OS, the way OSs do it is they download these tarballs that are uploaded by the maintainer. These are not, as we saw, these are not Git, like, just a great Git zip. And the reason why they do it is because they pre generate, like, these some of these M4 files. Which we probably should stop doing and just generate straight out of the Git tree. Like, stop putting generated code in our tarball that's only in tarballs. So, so there's a whole bunch agree. of like, there's a whole bunch of like changes that aren't like, are about like how we package Linux packages also probably should change because of this. Yep. The, those need to be changed. I'd also argue that. We should not be running. Well, there, there's two different philosophies on if you're building stuff that you should unit test off of your built artifacts versus run the unit tests, and then after the, those gated that gated uh, run finishes, then build your, your production level stuff. And yeah, the, that's a whole big long fight that you, you can have. But uh, basically, the unit testing stuff needs to be completely stripped away before you build before you do anything with the the actual building of prod uh, code would be one thing that would help or you build your prod code you run the unit test and then you throw it all away and then you just rebuild your prod code again yeah so would a thing that could have prevented this then be that if they like they decided as a project that instead of having a, a binary blob of compressed LZMA data to test against, that they had an algorithm generate the code that they're testing against so that they they could validate that, like, hey, this is actually the code, it's the blob that it's supposed to be, rather than yeah. just trusting that the blob was the blob. Yeah, like I mean, if you had no... That definitely would work. If you had no bi if, you, if if you had the rule, no binary blobs in the in the source tree, and it was and you had to generate it, there's a possible like th how this one simply worked would be prevented. Now, could you hide stuff in the generation code? Maybe, but it's a whole lot harder to hide stuff in that generation code versus just here's a blob. 
we said it's bad, but actually, if you do this wacky nonsense, it's actually a valid valid file now that has all the malicious stuff in it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's not not to say that there's uh, it would be impossible, but it, it would make life a lot harder. It's not like we have any minor blobs anywhere in Linux. I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you'd have to have uh, the butterfly effect level of fiddling bits in the source code and setting and docking things and all sorts of weird and shenanigans. Maybe, but, but aren't there like a bajillion binary blobs that are, isn't that part of the whole that, that's part complaint of the about? Freaking RMS that I like, don't oh, know, you shouldn't have any binary blood, but I mean, granted, his philosophy on it's different, but but at the end of the day, it comes down to a core issue of trust, right? Yep. You had a, min a maintainer of that repo putting in malicious stuff in it. Sure, there's little ways you could try to make it harder for them to sneak it by you, but at the end of the day, you're trusting the code that they give you. And like, you can't look at all this code. Right? No. So, even if you make it so you can't have these uh, extra binary blocks and all that other stuff, like you, you still have this trust issue. And this yeah comes to like a fundamental thing with open source, right? That we've been struggling with for yeah. decades. Like, okay, we we get all these people can come together to make stuff. That's great, um, but we need people to keep looking at it. So like the fact that he could, this person could sneak their way in, uh, is a feature of open source and the yeah. fact that we, somebody else saw it and caught it is a feature. Um, and I don't know how you can better balance that. Like, yeah, that's my question. Like, how do you solve that issue? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I'm struggling. Like, I think of it, I think of it very similar to the whole like Spectre meltdown stuff and how people are, you know, some of the people complaining about like, oh, like, you know, another day, another exploit. Like, why does this keep happening? Because that's how the hardware is designed. Like, you're talking about the core fundamental physical 